a week before uh, Secretary Wolfowitz uh, left the Department of Defense and became the president of the World Bank, he signed off a charter, a new charter for the CIO of the Department of Defense. Next slide, please. My purpose today is to make sure that uh, the full impact of what this charter conveys is understood because it may be setting the pattern for years to come. Next slide. The function uh, that uh, traditionally the, the uh, CIO, you don't have that. You don't have that. I just added that. <laughs> this is just to make sure you're awake, that's all. <laughs> Obviously, everybody was leafing, so that means you're alert. Um, the, the traditional view of uh, IT was that it was involved with system design, computing, and communication, and the larger domain of information management and business system was always outside. So although uh, the, there are, uh, the Klinger Cohen bill talks about the CIOs, the CIOs are not CIOs, they are chief technical officers, usually uh, nailed down for purchasing of uh, computers that they don't need. So uh, the, what Wolfowitz is doing is in view of the fact that the United States of America is now looking at information superiority uh, as the basis for its military power, uh, the charter of the office of the CIO has been enlarged. Next slide. The, um, uh, Functions which I will be discussing today uh, are really dealing with the issue of uh, inventory of uh, information system, contingency plans, internet and web administration, training career development of the enterprise, and uh, the expansive view of the DLD CIO responsibilities now include uh, a broad range of subjects that previously have never been included. The most important item that I want to highlight, of course, is the fact that information resource management now extends the scope of this responsibility quite extensively. Next slide. So how does a CIO then exercise the authority? Uh, first, the CIO uh, is forced to evaluate performance against metrics. Uh, uh, the CIO has to, um, uh, makes it mandatory to approve budget requests. And by the way, in the Department of Defense, annually, the so-called Form 300 uh, involves over 7,000 budget requests in excess of $1 million. The CIO has to sign off, at least by charter, for every expenditure in excess of a million dollars. And by the way, uh, a, a congressional decision has just been made that uh, starting October 1st, senior defense leaders could be held in violation of Title 31 of the Anti-Deficiency Act by jail terms. This is the first time in the history of the computing profession that a computer executive is uh, uh, punishable by jail for malfeasance, which of course means that for the first time the CIO is elevated to the level of CFOs. The reason CFOs have their prominence, of course, is that they can go to jail. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, all of you, and I understand at least one person here wants to be a CIO, I just want you to know that uh, that is an ambition that has a reverse side as well of, of the advantage. Um, uh, that means that the, the CIO can stop programs that has never been in, in the charter. Uh, the CIO can lay their hand on any of the six to 7,000 programs and basically uh, say stop until uh, we either 
uh, review it or discontinue it. So here we have given the power of the czar. Uh, I think that there's some bad things about what happened to czars, but um, at any rate, um, the, the, the CIO now has the power of stopping projects. I, I think you can see that uh, all of the functions, they are very powerful. Um, one of the most powerful functions is number 11. Uh, the so-called DOD instruction has basically inter inside the Department of Defense the power uh, of uh, a regulatory uh, declaration. And that is an awesome power because uh, the CIO now has the authority to issue a directive that will regulate a broad range of functions. Next slide. Clearly, in order to do this, the CIO has to establish uh, a whole machinery. Uh, I, I would say that uh, based on my experience, when I look at uh, organizations, by the way, the largest IT budget in the United States uh, is uh, by J.P. Morgan Chase, $4 billion. And the CIO function has a staff of 700. So if I scale up to the current spending of DOD, uh, which is 30, $31 billion, uh, we are now talking uh, a factor of eight and uh, that would pretty well fill up a large portion of a wing on the Pentagon. I don't think that's going to happen. So one of the problems which I want to note here is that just giving responsibility is not sufficient when uh, authority has to be executed. Um, uh, training and career development, information research requirement. There's a whole branch of the Department of Defense and also in large organizations like Google, like AOL, like IBM, where research is done because that's the business of the, of the company. And uh, so the CIO has a, say, has a say about the research that has, be, has to be applied inside the company. I want to point out to you that that uh, many of the advanced organizations actually are uh, using their internal shop uh, as a research ground. Uh, one of the reasons Google, for instance, is absolutely superb is that they have structured the entire part of the development organization as a large research shop. Um, next slide. So uh, this miraculous person, who is, by the way, still waiting uh, Senate approval. Um, the President has requested the Senate in June to approve John Grimes to the position of the DOD CIO. Uh, I think there must be people somewhere scared about the power that goes with the Charter, and therefore the uh, appointment has been held up. Uh, but that's where we are. Nevertheless, the CIO reports to the Secretary of Defense and the Deputy Secretary of Defense, uh, chairs and executive councils, a whole list of uh, functions which are attributed. Obviously, this is a person uh, that, uh, that will have to have many heads and uh, a huge staff in order to execute all of this. So all of you who want to be CIOs, can aspire to a long list of skills that you have to jam into your short semesters here. <laughs> so just, be, just understand you have been warned. Next slide. So what I will do now, I will take apart these individual functions one at a time and just show you what it all means. And my purpose here is to give you a taste of what a CIO has to do in order to uh, take one of these line items that I mentioned and uh, execute them. Next slide. Um, first, the important revelation here is that IT is only one part of information resources. Uh, typically, uh, in the commercial sector, IT represents about two and a half to three percent of revenue. Information resources, which is mostly staff, market researchers, 
um, educators, human resource department, finance, people who are information workers consume in excess of 22% of revenue. In fact, uh, for about 60% of US corporations, uh, the cost of information workforce is greater than the cost of the people who are actually working in factories. And the reason this is so is that the world has now, uh, and corporation has become an integrator. The Department of Defense is an integrator. 78% of the value of the Department of Defense is produced by contractors. General Motors buys 78% of the components and parts that are put into a car. General Motors uh, workforce is only about 16% of the total uh, revenue. So these are staggering uh, numbers. So if you want to be a CIO and you want to be an information manager, you have to understand that the economics deals not only with the stuff that you see in a data center or the desktops. That's a detail. You have to look at the stuffing that surrounds the information processing power of a firm. Um, the most demanding thing, of course, on the, uh, on the CIO is, is to deliver an integrated architecture so that uh, the, uh, the command uh, group uh, in a small squad uh, riding ponies of Afghanistan can talk to the Air Force and to the Navy and get logistic support in time. Uh, that means that you must have what's called interoperability. That doesn't exist today. There are very few firms in the world that have interoperability. Perhaps the most successful firm that has interoperability is Walmart and Federal Express. So the task for the CIO is to take uh, uh, Walmart and Federal Express and scale it up again by a factor of about 100. Um, the whole idea of uh, having components available uh, for applications so that uh, the organization can continually reconfigure itself is one of the tasks. Um, what I would like to suggest to you that uh, the issue of quantitative metrics is necessary because if you are sitting on the earring in the Pentagon and you have a limited staff, the only way how you can control this enormous empire, which includes contractors, which is hundreds of thousands of people involved in systems work, you must have measures uh, so that you know uh, which pieces are working or not. Again, uh, the Capitol Hill uh, makes you punishable by, uh, by, uh, by jail sentence if you don't do that. So that gets attention. So um, uh, work process improvement is now launched as a new program. And that means streamlining uh, of the way how uh, workflow goes and uh, how information is processed. Next slide. Um, when you become a CIO, whether it's of the Department of Defense or any organization, the first thing that you ought to do is to look at what I call the tooth-to-tail ratio. Namely, how much of the IT is deployed really uh, to compete and competition can be military or commercial, and what portion is just sort of holding it together, which everybody talks is sort of the overhead or bureaucracy or other pejorative terms. Um, uh, sometimes it's called faculty administration in universities, but I don't want to dwell on that subject here. But at any rate, I want you to know the uh, tooth-to-tail ratio of the Department of Defense is, uh, is not very good, and uh, that means that uh, only one-fourth of the IT resources are clearly identified is associated with war fighting, which is the business that uh, the DOD is all about. Next slide. Now, before you uh, feel that you have really achieved something, I just want to tell you that 
What really hurts uh, a CIO is not what you finally know, but what you don't know. So uh, again, uh, it's the bullet that you don't know that's coming at you that's going to kill you. The bullets that whizzes by, you know, you know about. So I just want you to know that that. Uh, although we know what the Navy, Army, Air Force, and agencies spend, there are additional um, 30, 40, 50 billion dollars uh, floating around of just IT. And, and, and the inside DOD uh, IT has to connect now with Homeland Security and with the Director of Intelligence and with the satellites in outer space. It doesn't show up on the budget of the CIO. Um, uh, one of the uh, very significant lessons to be learned from, particularly from Federal Express, is that the great expansion of Federal Express took place when they finally realized that they have to tap into the mail rooms, into the, into the accounting practices of individual mail rooms, and basically harness that capability for total integration so that they can do status reporting all the way in real time. Uh, the caveat here is that, uh, again, the externality, uh, the, the fact that, that uh, you may be the CIO, uh, but uh, the contractors are producing code. And you have to sign for the code. You have to certify the code. And most importantly, there is a particular set of defense directives dealing with information assurance and reliability. So for instance, if you happen to be the CIO of the Missile Defense Organization, and uh, Lockheed and Boeing are producing uh, the various components for firing a missile, and when it happens that you misfire, happens, happens even to NASA. Um, then, then it's the CIO and the organization, not the contractor, uh, that uh, where the Congress goes for uh, evidence of of incompetence or neglect. Next slide. Now, um, those of you who are teaching a course of statistics should know that it's not totally in vain, despite the insistence of your professors. Uh, histograms are very important. Uh, one of the things that I always do is I don't look at averages. Uh, I always look at distributions. And one of the real fundamental problems that exist today and why the tail ratio is so high in the Department of Defense and in most commercial organizations as well is that uh, there are islands of systems and the systems eat maintenance cost and the systems have to be continually upgraded. So you have these islands, and therefore, uh, you see in this distribution out of approximately 4,000 projects in the Department of Defense, 2,600 are less than 2 million, which in the Department of Defense is considered to be a threshold level of funding, of which about half of it goes for bureaucracy. And, and, and so forth. So uh, these are no, the reason you, your inefficiency is high is because you are, your projects, which are increasingly call for integration, in fact, are distributed to very small entities and small contracts. Next slide. So um, what are the IRM responsibilities? Uh, they are rather clear. Uh, the ARM responsibility is that the CIO has to see to it that uh, um, the uh, uh, value is maximized, and NSS stands for national security, and that uh, it includes a whole range of bureaucracies that have their own acquisition power. Um, uh, lastly, there is a thing that has been slipped here for the first time. Um, reduce data and information collection burden of the public and businesses. One of the reasons many of the costs uh, in the Department of Defense and in many agencies and also in corporations are so high is because the acquisition costs, filling out the forms to sell something, 
for instance, um, you know about the famous case about the $600 toilet seats that were installed on uh, the Casey uh, tankers, uh, which was a big scandal. And uh, uh, my, my uh, answer to that thing was, well, uh, that was a bargain because it did not include the administrative costs on the part of the Department of Defense and most likely the enormous uh, legal costs involved of just bidding on delivering a toilet seat which is highly specialized on an airplane. So, um, uh, so much for that. Next slide. Modernization. That is the hot subject in this town. It has just been launched uh, on Friday in testimony uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Congress. It's called the BMMP, Business Management Modernization Program. You, I'm sure you must understand it's the same program over and over again except after a few years when it really hurts, you rename the program and spend money, more money. <laughs> So uh, uh, I hope that this time, because we are, running, we are really running out of money, uh, we are finally going to do it. Um, I've uh, overlooked how this program is being uh, managed. It's clearly a topic for a dissertation in, the, in, in your school or a major paper to understand how that thing is put together. And the key to, to, um, to the future of the role of the CIO is networking. Um, what has really happened uh, in the last five years, particularly because of the internet, uh, the demands for, uh, for information technology available instantly on the spot uh, by the fighting uh, men and women has escalated. Uh, the need for information is instant. Uh, people uh, have been spoiled with Google. They apparently are able to get answers they couldn't get any other before. Uh, I've been told that uh, the implantation of Google on uh, college campuses of America has increased the IQ of all college students by at least 20 percent. And it will most likely reflects in these very smart uh, uh, citations that you're able to put into your text through searches. So not plagiarism, just citations. <laughs> um, but networking is very important. And so uh, the Department of Defense has launched itself on a thing called Gig Global Information Grid. Uh, that is a very far-reaching view of providing broadband, 100 gigabyte broadband, throughout the entire Department of Defense, securely and separately from internet, because inter internet is totally porous from a security standpoint. So uh, I would suggest that this development is one of the most exciting enablers and my next lecture in December will be dealing with the whole subject of design of networking. And I will be using Google Network, which has just been renamed Googleplex, by the way. The Google Network is called the Googleplex. Uh, and how it has been designed to provide wideband support, both through uh, wired access, cable, as well as wireless. Um, command and control is really the business of the Department of Defense. Uh, that is where uh, the ability to compete, wage war, or defend is necessary. Um, uh, clearly, those of you who have been following uh, the uh, command control uh, finger pointing in New Orleans recently understand that without good communication and a good uh, command and control design, uh, you are going to have chaos in view of the fact that all of the services and various service components have been building their own uh, custom-made command and control systems at the cost of hundreds of billions of dollars. Uh, nobody disagrees that we need an integrated command and control system, including intelligence. The question is not what, but how to get there. So the transition planning is really the key. 
Next slide. Part of the uh, responsibility for the uh, CIO of the Department of Defense deals with communications, um, which deals with uh, space and wireless. Uh, my sense is that lots of the uh, communication links which today exist, uh, which are either a copper wire uh, uh, strung on poles or cable or even optical fiber, um, uh, certainly coaxial cable for cable television is going to become obsolete because the, uh, the wireless environment is much more effective and potentially more secure. And therefore, the whole idea of creating an environment where the United States will control the space, which is air and above, becomes a major strategic issue. And those of you who can wish to study this particular area uh, would have an incredibly rewarding and exciting career in pursuing those kind of opportunities. Next slide. Next slide. Um, ultimately, the issue of uh, information management, he said, has to do with enterprise integration. In other words, uh, ultimately integration deals with what the economists uh, define as transaction cost. Transaction cost, uh, which is the cost that is consumed by the fact that things don't integrate and you need administrators and expediters and liaison officers all over the place for things to work together, to splice together. Um, so you then need um, integrations with uh, non-intelligence space strategies, uh, non-intelligence dealing, uh, of course, with transmission, uh, both uh, 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 Earth transmission and also outer space transmission uh, with satellites and with each others in uh, space platforms. Uh, and that means that the architecture of how you're going to construct a thing is going to take uh, certainly uh, two to three trillion dollars just in the Department of Defense over the next 10 to 15 years. A career opportunities for all of you, if you know, and develop the specialties of dealing with that. And that means interoperability the ability of dissimilar technologies to be able to communicate as a technology evolves. For instance, uh, we are going now from uh, 802.11g 802 to 802.11.n uh, frequencies in uh, local area networks, uh, uh, wireless networks. Uh, you have invested a great deal of equipment to receive the old frequencies. You cannot junk it all. You don't have enough money. So you have to create the necessary interfaces. Uh, there's lots of systems, so-called legacy systems, which are limping along, but the idea of totally replacing them is beyond the affordability of anybody today, including large corporations. So uh, how you are then going to deal with that, and most importantly, with knowledge management, which will be the subject of my lecture in spring. Uh, after you have achieved all of this technology, what about people? You know, how do people fit into a, an environment which is uh, continually being disrupted with organizational and technological changes? Uh, the next slide, the key to uh, all of this thing is data management. This is perhaps the most neglected piece uh, of, uh, of technology, uh, except that if you know your Old Testament uh, and, uh, and the story about the Tower of Babel, you understand that the way how you confounded human enterprise is you messed, the Lord messed up the data dictionary. And so all the construction stopped. 
So, uh, so um, all I'm saying is those of you who are looking for career opportunity or specialization in software, I certainly recommend to you uh, data administration and data management is perhaps the pinnacle of technology development and maybe your next career step before you move up to management levels. But without understanding data management, in my view, you cannot be a CIO. Next slide. Information assurance. Well, the good news is technology is terrific. Uh, the bad news is technology is vulnerable and is increased vulnerability to our society and to our uh, to our ability to compete. Uh, the, the vulnerability of our networks, the vulnerability of our databases, and the increased uh, uh, sophistications of in attackers mean that, that the discipline of information warfare, namely how you blind and eliminate or confuse or spook the communication channels of your adversary becomes one of the cheapest way how you can fight uh, somebody, uh, somebody uh, who is more powerful to you from a technology standpoint. Now this requires, uh, next slide, a whole set of security overlays and that means that um, you must suddenly be in a position to warrant as a CIO uh, that you have signed off on the information of assurance of thousands and thousands of systems. And it's not only on new systems, but the systems as they get retrofitted, upgraded. In other words, you have just downloaded the latest goodies from Microsoft. And now before you populate it uh, to the entire uh, uh, army or navy, uh, you have to make sure that there is nothing hidden in the code that is being used to upgrade everybody's desktop. And that nothing has been slipped into the desktop that will sit there dormant. Now that's called information assurance. Um, the responsibilities uh, uh, for information assurance are awesome, difficult, very demanding, and if you are moderately or exceedingly compulsive by nature, uh, there, are, there are psychological descriptions for that kind of personality. So I will not engage in that. But if you are anal compulsive, uh, I think that this would be an excellent uh, career opportunity for you. Uh, I, I hope I will not be reprimanded for using these terms. Next slide. Spectrum management. One of the major problems as we move from copper wire and cable into the space communication is to deal with spectrum. There's a limited amount of spectrum out there. And the question is, how will that spectrum be managed and controlled and what protocols will apply in the various pieces of the spectrum? Next slide. Um, in the area of network operations, after you got it all in put in place, you, you got your data center in, your frequency in, your satellites are in, everything has been assured and nothing can go wrong. Uh, you have then specific responsibilities for making sure that the thing works and the thing is robust um, so that, so that um, the system will work under conditions of extreme failure. Uh, over the weekend, um, uh, I received a message from uh, a particular organization to be left nameless, and they said, well, we are shutting down uh, for the weekend for two and a half days because we are reconfiguring our data center to be earthquake proof. This was a data center located two miles from St. Andreas Fault. Now, uh, Somebody who would congratulate these people, that the wonderful thing, they're finally uh, putting the data center into a concrete box. Um, uh, you would commend them for that. 
uh, especially since they boast themselves of how little money they spend in doing this. Uh, I grossly condemn them because there is still a concrete box uh, in the proximity of the St. Andreas Fault. And you cannot have a mission critical data center located as a single point of failure if you depend on that data center to operate. So I took their uh, exuber, you know, their enthusiastic announcement about shutting down for only two and a half uh, days in order to give you a better data center as an indication that these people are vulnerable to a single point of failure. So uh, one of the responsibilities of the, uh, of the CIO is to fish for um, uh, single points of failure. Next slide. Next slide. Um, there are lots of responsibilities that over the years have been shifted by Congress to, uh, to the Department of Defense. Uh, one of them includes GPS, m management of the GPS operations, and um, the whole question of the uh, contingency support of the Federal Aviation uh, Authority administration so that um, under emergency conditions which happened on 9-11 uh, the military can take over the FAA. Now this is a very difficult politically loaded kind of an issue uh, how a DOD CIO can possibly deal with that problem I don't know but it's on the plate. Next slide. Contingency and migration, uh, I will just add uh, a sense of reality to all of these gr grandiose ideas and responsibilities. This is a partial diagram of a subsystem of the Department of Defense. And so now the job is to streamline it, simplify it, make it interoperable with uh, spaghetti uh, diagrams like this, and there's thousands of them. And make sure that when things fail in any one, it doesn't propel and doesn't migrate into the other uh, diagrams like this. Uh, as a way of putting this thing in a perspective, let me just show you uh, what I see as the challenge. Next slide. Uh, this is uh, my brief history of computing over the last 50 years. Um, and the variables that you should be looking at is that what has happened fundamentally over the last 50 years is that it was each generation of technology and each change in a cost curve, the variable that dictated was the response time. Uh, when I started in computing with tabulating machines, believe it or not, in 1955, my first job was as a tabulating manager, by the way. Some of you may not even know what that is, but there were things like, called punch cards with holes in it, and you counted the holes. I, I used to do that. Um, but we had a month, you know, we, we did monthly counting. Then you, when salespeople came in, we went into weekly monitoring of sales. Uh, the warehouse uh, uh, had to have information in days. Uh, then Walmart and Federal Express came, they are down to hours. Uh, and of course, uh, when you are dealing with a rapid response requirement on the internet, you are down to minutes response time, although Google's universal response time is 0.25 seconds globally for all the inquiries. So if you are dealing with uh, things like missile defense, you are dealing with sensor inputs. Uh, you are dealing with real-time sensor integration. And that means that, uh, next slide, when you are looking at the dimensions of design, and I, I believe that these last, these two slides are very critical in your understanding, both for you and the faculty, that we are going through a cusp of discontinuity. And that is that 
as the environment shrinks, the number of inputs that go into that environment go up uh, by a cubic function. It's a cubic function. And so you have this enormous change where none of the old rules of design and architecture apply. Um, uh, again, uh, the, uh, the current um, largest network that I know of is Google's 200,000 servers processing approximately 80 million inquiries a day and growing at the rate of approximately 8% per month. So scaling that kind of a requirement while the workload is growing and keeping it economical and meanwhile maintaining response time is an unbelievably demanding task that is going to stretch this generation that sits here in this room. Next slide. So what you then have to have, you have to have a sense of contingency responsibilities so that when these large networks that depend on real-time inputs of billions of pieces of data that have to be analyzed and made available in a very precise, limited form so it's comprehensible to a human being. You must understand your ears are only good for 300 baud's and if your eyes are very good and your brain is uh, uh, just graduated from this school, uh, you are maybe a tenth of a megahertz in your eyes when you are alert in the morning. <laughs> so I just want you to know there's this total mismatch between the amount of information out there and the speed and the integration requirement. Lastly, next slide, not to be forgotten is the old world, next slide, which is records management. Um, the government loves paper and all paper is now electronic and all paper is migrating into the uh, electronic form. And so the new regulations require that all emails have to be archived. All emails have to be archived so they cannot be tampered with. And uh, they must be available as evidence and uh, authentic evidence so that they have not been tampered with. So I would just going to complete now, next slide, my litany of things to scare you or encourage you. I've given you 12 things that you should be uh, preparing yourself for. Uh, pick one, pick any one, and uh, concentrate on that. Uh, it may give you a wonderful career. Next slide. What I try to do uh, today is to tell you that the new charter for the Department of Defense CIO is uh, a breakthrough in conceptual view of what uh, the management of information technology is all about. Uh, the directive is on the books. Now we have to live up to it. And uh, all I want you to know is this is a benchmark against we should be judging uh, not only the performance of our existing CIOs, but also the performance of yourself in planning your career. Next slide. So what I have done, and you don't have this slide on, I don't believe so, is where we started uh, 50 years ago down with a very limited technology custodianship. In fact, today has no limits. It's all encompassing. It is the enterprise. Information is the enterprise. Information is the warfare. Information is the information superiority. Next slide. Uh, since uh, I'm sure this must raise lots of questions, other than doing uh, uh, personal consulting on matters other than information technology, uh, you have my email. You can uh, dial into my blog. Uh, your, I will screen what you write 
and uh, I will then um, post your question in my answer. Your question will be anonymous uh, because I think that's only appropriate under the circumstances uh, so that uh, your overcritical faculty uh, may not uh, find a dumb question as evidence of your grades. So thank you very much. <laughs>